complete. All right. I can share my screen with the notes. Um, nope, because I'm on a new computer and I apparently haven't. I can share my screen. Yeah, can somebody do that. Sorry, I uh, apparently haven't. I don't have the right permissions. Okay, so welcome to the Chaos OSPO Working Group meeting. Um, uh, sorry, I'm getting error messages from Zoom now. Uh, we, are, <laughs> we are under the Chaos Code of Conduct, so please be kind to each other. Uh, we have we have a pretty full agenda actually, and um, people are willing to uh, you know happy to entertain additional items if somebody's willing to add any additional agenda items. Um, but with that, maybe uh, maybe we turn it over to Gary because this is the agenda item that we didn't get to in the last meeting, which was around AI governance and OSPOs. So maybe if you want to kick us off, sure. So just to set the scene, we were talking about uh, AI quite a bit in the last uh, last OSPO um, working group meeting, and it popped into my brain to ask the question of how folks in this call are thinking about governing AI and if that's an OSPO responsibility, because in the scope of OSPO maturity models and working in organizations that are staying like current with what's happening in the world, AI is going to be something we have to think about, whether it's something that actually winds up impacting businesses and productivity and all that good stuff or not. And I think that um, we have seen some interesting um, requests to use AI. We've seen some interesting approvals and some interesting denials so far. And it usually has to do with um, different components of what goes into an AI model and what goes into an AI data set. And I thought I'd uh, open the um, floor to ask that question. And I have my own opinions, but I'd like to hear what people have to think first and then kind of put in a little bit more context as the conversation goes. I can say from my experience developing chaos metrics in the open source scientific community that whenever I encounter a repository that stores its computational models, it takes a really time, a really long time to process changes because Git deals with them like they're large, giant multi-gig pieces of text. So there's a practical matter of them not really being software artifacts, but being essential for the execution of software. Okay, speaking to that, um, and I don't really have an opinion around metrics because for that basically that same reason, at least yet, however, I can share, and some of you may already be aware of this, uh, Stefano, the executive director of the OSI, is conducting a series of workshops this summer and fall. Um, their OSI is trying to nail down an open source definition for AI, um, which is the, the too long, don't read version. Um, and so there will be a session about this at FOSSI uh, next month. Um, so if any of you are there, you might want to come. That might help inform this discussion a little bit. Um, okay. But yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, it should be something we should think about metrics-wise. And Ed, you have your hand up. Yeah, so regarding governance, um, at Equinix, the same set of people who are talking about uh, AI are the same set of people who are talking about um, open source. There's an overlap there, yeah. but it actually brings in additional uh, folks from legal uh, considering risk and responsibility and uh, potential liability for things. Um, there's a, a sort of a heightened sense of uncertainty and, and risk assessment going on, uh, which I think I can say uh, openly. Um, and just, those risks uh, go well beyond the usual uh, compliance risks that open source folks have to think about. So it's going to have an expanded um, expanded uh, audience for that there. So if you, I mean, I think the, the risk, if I understand it, would be if I do share a computational model that's been developed for a particular purpose, 
then in addition to some responsibility for the software, I may also bear some legal responsibility for what happens with the model that I shared. So it's yeah, I think it happens. I think it happens both on consumption and production. Um, mm -hmm. If I consume a model that has some proprietary information in it, and then that leaks into my the internal work product, um, you know, could that have bad implications as well? Mm -hmm. um, most of these large language models have a very opaque uh, training set, and yeah, uh, the chance of something going wrong is non-zero. Um, somebody um, shared this. In the, this. You can see this link if you want to go to it on your own. The blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights it might be useful for some. I don't want to go through it here, but yeah. now, I've, now I've lost track of where I am. There we go. I'm back. Matt, you have your hand up. Yeah. What, what's the relationship with metrics here? Just I think... I. I I mean, it might be tenuous. It might be more of a, a question just for OSPOs in general. I think but... there's a, if the models are distributed as an open, as part of an open source software project, then there's a risk question that I'm hearing that has not been explored or itemized from a metrics point of view yet. Right. So that's, that's what I'm hearing too. Yeah. Okay. Like, and I, I think too, it might be interesting for, um, for, OSPOs to be able to, I don't know, have some metrics that would help them better understand if their people are using some of these particular tools. Um, I think <coughs> that would be interesting. Yeah, like hugging face scrapers, similar to kind of what happens on GitHub for a lot of the things to look out for as we shape the opinion of what needs to be looked out for. Yeah, how we do that, I, I don't know. Uh, Christine, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, uh, so the one thing is just like, like you said, um, the metrics could be just looking at hugging face. And so some authors are involved in just helping to figure out which models are open source, truly open source, kind of open source, <laughs> and uh, what are the licenses. And even sometimes it's computationally like, because you're trying to figure out what's going to be the cost of it and even just getting some of that information could be related to metrics if the model is this size or that size. And then also, um, I'm also part of an OpenSSF AIML, thinking of becoming a working group uh, related, just kind of like spun up because of this. And so in that case, they might be thinking about um, um, things related to security risks and uh, bringing out white papers. But even just like, with, I'm assuming that in the future as an OSPO, and if you're in charge of bringing in models, or helping with security and evaluating models, there might be some metrics that could be of interest that could come from some of that those information that information. Has anyone thought about or that's really good that the open SSF is doing something. I'm curious if anybody has thought about what are my responsibilities from a copyright perspective. So if I build a a, a model for machine learning, but I built it using data from the internet that I perhaps explicitly don't have the rights to distribute, but I use that you know, non-distributable source data to build a computational model. Has, has there been any discussion anywhere about what then? I, I can definitely share that um, there are <laughs> models in the wild that, uh, are trained from data sets like Common Crawler, which mm -hmm. literally crawls the internet and makes absolutely no copyright claims or license claims about how that data gets used in models and uh, eventually uh, AI-like tools. And so those things are fine for a cool project that you publish on Hugging Face and make absolutely no money off of, but could potentially cause uh, problems if we ever use them in a commercial product. Mm -hmm. So Brian, please. you have your hand up. I mean, adding to that, I can share that, I, and I don't think this is a surprise for anybody, Red Hat and other organizations that I'm aware of, we have reflexively told everybody, don't even think about using any kind of um, MML um, or L, LLM, sorry, um, mm -hmm. around code generation because of the copyright issues. We just don't know where it's coming from and where it's learning from. 
So again, this is a very reflexive um, reaction that I'm sure will evolve over time. But right now, everybody, we don't understand it. So it's like, we're just don't even think about using Let's it. Let's not do that. Yeah. Right. Because we just, we, we don't know what it opens ourselves up to. This is the co-pilot discussion, really, for GitHub all over again. Um, you know, we, it's, it's hard. So yeah, we're separating it out. It's the, the, the LLMs in particular as, as what are they in terms of artifact or whatever. And then their product though, that's the thing that's raised a fairly alarmist and conservative uh, response, which is basically until we figure this out, nope, we're done. You know, but I strongly suspect that there are people in my company who are ignoring that too, because it's not half bad, you know, but that's another conversation. We do have a lot of things on the agenda. Is there anything else anybody wants to chime in quickly on this one before we move to the next item on the agenda? Okay. Thanks for bringing that up, Gary. That was a really interesting, uh, interesting discussion. Um, Matt, you're next on the agenda. Yep. I'll try to be brief. It's an update from our conversation from two weeks ago. And so I'm trying to bring a couple threads together here. So one is um, some of you may know or may not know. Uh, we've been in, there's a been invited pretty much to do a book chapter for the um, book that Anna's putting together in the to-do group around uh, metrics that could be useful in an OSPO sense. And so one of the questions that we kind of had when we were thinking about initial drafts of the book chapter was we should, it might be useful to know what other chapters were about so we could either <laughs> work with them or mm -hmm. not say something different or not repeat what's being said, you know, just to get some context on what we could say. And so that was one thread that was kind of in the back of my mind. Um, the other thread was the conversation around maturity models that we had last time and ways to kind of frame um, what metrics and metrics models might be useful for people in open source program offices. And so as opposed to just kind of throwing out metrics and metrics models and saying, here, <laughs> they're all available, you figure out how to use them and how to make them you know, provide context in your own sense. Maybe we could provide some of that context for other people um, as they approach metrics and metrics models. So I'm trying to bring these two threads together. Um, and so I'll I'll ask Sean to click on that link. Which the one? Presentation the, link in the third. That, not fourth. that, the third no, the, the, No, this down. one. There this one. Go. Got it. <clears throat> okay. So this should look familiar from a couple weeks ago. And so what I did was there was there have been kind of a couple discussions around maturity models or stages of growth and the reaction to that has been mediocre in the sense that um, not all not every open source program office has to do everything to demonstrate say maturity or growth right and that you don't have to do all the things and so that's i i get that no problem there and so the four things across the top um, and so at this point, I'm calling them OSPO activities. Another phrase or word could be used, no problem. Um, the Across the top is adoption, education, engagement, and leadership. And what I did was I pulled those from, Sean, could you pull up that PDF from down below? Yes. So I can't pull it up because it downloads, but this PDF down here at the bottom in the notes, and I can, and that link is shared in our notes, and I'll also share a link to these slides in the chat. So people can download it, but my version of Zoom does, or my version of a browser does not let me show it in the browser. It just downloads the PDF. Okay. So the PDF is, um, it was a, you've probably all seen it. It was a publication from the Linux Foundation. It talked about stages of growth of an OSPO, and they provided a maturity model in that, in that document. I, it's not too deep into the report, maybe page six or seven. And I thought, why why would I try to you know reinvent some of those headings when in fact I think it was Chris Anacek who had written that document has kind of done this. So that's 
So if you could go back to that first slide, that adoption, education, engagement, and leadership are pulled from that, that PDF that Sean shared, condensed just a little bit. And so those are meant to be kind of these high level activities that may or may not be helpful within an open source program office. Um, down below are particular practices that may or may not be representative of adoption, may or may not be representative of education and so on and so forth. And I tried to try to kind of fill those out based on the conversation we had a couple of weeks ago. And then Sean, if you could go to say slide four. Within there then, so under the education, legal education would be three objectives. Again, just these are me just putting those objectives out there. And then metrics and metrics models that might help you gain better insight against those objectives. So it's really meant to frame frame the conversation that occurs often in in this group, um, so that we could understand where metrics and metric models might be useful against a particular objective, against a particular practice, and in that domain coming from that PDF. So not only might it help us do two things two things one is it might help us think about metrics and metrics models that achieve particular things inside of an ospo and two it might help us write a chapter in the book that kind of builds on a, you know the prior chapter chapter two that says hey these were the stages of growth that were presented earlier we're just kind of thinking about ospos and we're going to build on that by kind of helping identify a few metrics and metrics models that might move an organization forward so that's it. I'm I'm done. You can and I've gotten rid of the whole maturity maturity model thing. So this is any any OSPO could kind of approach this framework however they see fit and what might be useful for them. Anyone have any questions for Matt? Any other thoughts on what you think about this? I guess just generally, what are you hoping to achieve as a next step? So, Sean, if you could go back to that. This? Yeah. Okay. Top slide or this? Whatever that might be. <laughs> so um, some, some detailed enumeration of the yeah. activities that might relate to legal education in practice in an OSPO. How do we yeah, so I guess, so if you go to slide one, like I would suspect that those those eight practices that I have below kind of in that lower blue section are not perfect by any means based on the conversations we've had. So I'd need some help in thinking through what some of those practices could be to help OSPOs at least think about some of these things, some of these activities. Um, and then to Sean's point, like if you click on slide two or whatever, like what might be some of those objectives to achieve that practice? I can I can just continue to listen to an open conversation and try to capture what I can. That's what I've been doing so far, or to to help really kind of solidify what some of those might be. Can we go back to the? Sorry, no, the first slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, the one the one thing that I don't really see here that's a key function of most open source program offices is compliance. I suspect that's buried somewhere under legal, but I haven't read the PDF. But that's about education. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, you're right. Okay, I'll, I'm going to put this in the notes. Um... Just add that the headline says OPSO activities and probably should be OSPO. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what do you know about that? <laughs> <laughs> I find that typo a lot, actually, because the spell checkers don't check acronyms. And I just found that in a blog post recently. <laughs> oh, it's opso across the board. Well, because uh, I just copied, I no, put yeah, it yeah. one place. For, I, 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 I made that it. assumption that it, it would probably made it to every slide. So I won't fix that in front of the crowd. Any any other last last comments before we move on? Okay. Um, the next, the next thing on the agenda. Sorry, I, I did, I did oh. want to like plus one. Christine just like pointed to the mind map. I feel like that's really helpful in this conversation too. Oh yeah, this is something that that uh, Anna has been driving within the to do group. 
Um, yeah. And it is a pretty interesting way of looking at it. That's a really good point. Uh, and then mind map, it goes out very far. So I will throw that link into our notes. What does this, what does it tell me here? That's a good question. Uh, see so roles because you were talking about activities and some of the things that happen. So it yeah. might even governance, project man management, somewhere in there should be compliance, but it'll help. So, so maybe under roles because I think in your you were talking about roles as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. compliance is right there under develop and execute an open source strategy. Yeah. It's probably in other places too, as we think. Down. I'm sure. <laughs> um, but what what I'm what I'm thinking about this, and maybe this is why you this is probably why you posted it, um, is I think this might help us figure out what the gaps are in the activities. I will put a put a link in here. <coughs> what was the purpose of the mind map? Or is that something being driven by to do or? Yeah, Anna's been driving that at the to do group. I don't remember what the original purpose of it was, to be honest. I don't remember. <laughs> I mean, I think it's I think it's a really the precursor to that PDF that that was linked to in terms of like trying to organize organize or understand like what the larger patterns are of hospital of hospital teams. Yeah, I've found it helpful, um, Me too. especially when I'm kind of like zeroing in on what we are doing and what we are not doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also what we could, could like, or, yeah, could be doing, and and maybe places where we should be like involved in the conversation that yes may may not be directly part of at the moment. AI potentially being one of them. Some really good comments in the chat from different people about how they've used the mind map as well. Like Emma, I mean, <laughs> that's the yeah. best one. <laughs> Emma got exactly right. Yeah. No, I'm I'm tired just looking at this right now. So. <laughs> and it, I mean, it tries to capture everything, and clearly we're not it, doing all of it. But these are. I mean, it depends on your hospital, right? Yeah. No, you have to do all of this to be a functional hospital. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And then we want metrics on everything. Yeah. Check, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fun to leave this. I mean, and the the whole like, I think the interface is kind of fun too. So, you know. Yeah. No, it's um, there's obviously a lot here. Plus emojis. Sorry. Um. Cool. Um, if somebody has some time, there's some really good comments in the chat. If people could paste some of those into the doc, that would be that would be awesome. Like, like Remy's uh, seen the pedal model, which might be an interesting way of describing this. Mm -hmm. um, but in the essence of time, I am going to go ahead and uh, move on. We have several agenda items le left. We have kind of an open call, and we talked about this, I think, in the last meeting about um, how we can talk more publicly about the metrics and metrics models we're using. Um, should we, what do people think? Should we try to cover that today? Or we have um, some more on the viability metrics models. We also have um, a couple of miscellaneous um, items at the end that people have added. Should we, should we skip the open call and come back to that next week? Or sorry, in two weeks. Or does anybody have burning desire to talk about that again this week? Um. All right. Uh, emojis. Thumbs up to talk about it this week. Thumbs down to punt it to next week. People have. Is there a thumbs down emoji? Oh. No, I but there's a nice. party emoji. Okay, party emoji to punch it to next week. Thumbs up to uh, talk about it now. <laughs> okay, so we're punching it to next week. Thanks. That was that was a ridiculous way of doing this, but uh, done. So, uh, Gary, uh, viability metrics models. Hi. Uh, I wanted to bring this up with this group first. This is like a uh, heavy overlap with two other working groups, the metrics model working group and the risk working group. 
um, but it also has some stake in OSPOs because I, I see the people who will likely use viability to be people in OSPOs who are considering whether or not certain open source projects are viable for their organization. Um, I've put together four components of viability based out of conversations that we had about viability before. Um, the conversations that we did have where I walked through what the viability model looked like uh, was very productive and extremely helpful to me in shaping what these look like. So I wanted to put it out there uh, that with these categories here, I would really appreciate anybody who has any time to donate or any interest in shaping what viability should look like, or, hey, this is pretty similar to another model that we have, like just looking for feedback, looking for input, looking for anything to help make them a little more uh, stable and Do you want me to for... open any of these, Gary? Um, I don't really want to like walk through them in this meeting because it okay. feels like I'm I'm lecturing about this is how I think this should work and I'm not even sure that they're right. So I'd be happy to to take them offline and do it asynchronously. Um, Ed, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I don't want to get go way deep into this, but um, I'm sure that risk fits into some part of this viability uh, thing, which is sort of more forward looking. Um, it may not be the current behavior of a certain organization, but it may be the anticipated future behavior of a certain open source organization that people might be concerned about for viability. Yep. And those kind of things I want to be able to capture in some way in the model. Uh, some way. Ho hopefully, like, not, I, I don't want to, like, have a thumb on the scale metric where it's like, I think that this shouldn't be used because that's not helpful. But I am definitely open to anything that you think is easy to cat or is categorizable um, in that way. Like, just off the top of my head, I think elephant factor might be good for that if Red Hat or whatever um, is maintaining a large uh, stake in a project that, that we're using. It may go from being viable to not viable based on other context. But like those are the kind of things and the kind of thoughts and comments that I really want to like make this model the best that it can be. Yeah, I wasn't going to mention the elephant in the room, but I would just say that <laughs> as we look as we look as we look forward on things, there's some things that may be very hard to quantify with current metrics that might be really relevant for anticipated futures. Totally. Yeah. And I, I also, um, in contrast to what I just said, I don't want it to be so cold that you can't put any context in or you can't have any opinion that you would need to elaborate on as you look at viability. But like, I'm trying to reduce it and find a good balance. Thank you for that. Okay. Thanks, Gary. So we have we all have the action item to have a look at the docs above and provide some some feedback if you have some some feedback for Gary. Um, okay, so the next one is uh, that our OSS EU panel has been accepted talking about determining um, OSPO value. So that's um, uh, myself, Chan, um, David Harsh, and um, Matt. So that's uh, super exciting. So we're excited to be doing that in um, in Bilbao. Um, oh, I think they're probably going to share her slides. What? Elizabeth's going to share the notes in a minute. Okay. Cool. Um, so that's that's pretty exciting. Um, I'm going to guess that there are probably some other related talks. I have a talk about how to grow your contributor base, which will have a a metrics section as well. Um, anybody else have talks at um, OSSEU that you want to mention? I um, I've got I've got a uh, talk with a colleague. Um, we're going to talk about measuring the impact of events, especially around like community events, which is really kind of tricky because you don't have anything like quantitative, like um, sales leads necessarily. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Remy's got his hand up. Yep. So the Ospoology monthly meeting that the to-do group does, we had a meeting a couple of months ago, maybe it was March, uh, talking about Ospos and highly regulated environments. Uh, it was well received and we proposed a sort of part two follow-up for that. So that has been accepted for uh, the EU summit 
I'll be attending remotely, but uh, our friends from like Amsterdam and a few other OSPOs in the government space and energy space will be attending in person. Thanks, Christine. Oh, so I, I have a talk. It's around um, experiences in the OSPO for uh, GitHub management. And there's gonna be an element in there around audit and metrics uh, that we use. And so that's also been accepted might tie into Eric's next agenda item as well. Nice. Hey, anyone else? Uh, it's not my talk, but I'll plug my friend Natalie Vlatko uh, did a Berlin buzzwords talk about building on ramps for non code contributors in open source that is also going to be at the EU event. Nice. Uh, Sophia. Uh, I also talk it in on metrics. I phrased it as metrics office hours. Uh, and basically, it was mostly around applying and communicating metrics inside of companies. Um, but I don't know if I can attend yet. So we'll see. <laughs> Maybe. Fair enough. Um, uh, Christine, do you still have your hand up? Or is that uh, OK, just an artifact? Um, uh, Eric. Hello. Yeah, I um, tagged this on to the end of it, and it's okay to not take up time here, but uh, feel free to ping me offline, as I said. But um, basically, so my team here at GitHub uh, has been, as a, a few of you have seen the organization metrics dashboard and the project dashboard we've been working on, we're actually going to sunset that due to some data backend changes that we are unable to keep up with, but we wanted to parlay that work into a more general purpose API focused solution for folks that will include some like a reference implementation on some common open source tooling. And uh, alongside of that, we wanted to see if there were things uh, that folks are doing in with their metrics today. If you're graphing or uh, building time series data off of GitHub API date off of the GitHub API, that is uh, um, either has chunks of it that are missing that you have to fill in or are computationally expensive, that if we could use uh, um, spend some time improving that on the back end to make your lives easier and to make the tools better, uh, we have some uh, engineering time and, and capacity to do that. So I wanted to put a call out and uh, just basically solicit feedback. And again, feel free to, I'm on the chaos Slack, so feel free to pay me there. But uh, if you're, if there's things that you're doing with the GitHub API that you wish were better, basically, uh, let me know about that and we will um, endeavor to, uh, to fix this, fix that stuff. I'm also really curious if people do have uh, existing like existence proofs of building uh, community health or project health dashboards using chaos metrics on um, tooling that you could share. I'd love to see it. And uh, and basically, see if we can turn that into a um, like a reference implementation for people who are just getting off the ground and uh, want to get started with uh, with metrics. What what would they what would be sort of the beginner dashboard that they'd be interested in looking at and how can we make that a templatized reusable thing um, that we could uh, that we could share with it with people that are just getting off the ground I do have one what's what's missing um, that I would like to see in the the github API which is um, dependence so dependencies are in there and if you go to the insights tab there's dependencies and then there's dependence and the dependents are not in the uh, either API, unfortunately. And there's something that I really, really, so so it's something that OSPOs really need because if we're looking, for example, at sunsetting a project, we really need to know how many other projects depend on that thing that we are thinking about not working on anymore. Because there've been a couple of cases at VMware where we've had teams come to us and be like, yeah, we don't think we want to work on this anymore. And we're like, no, I mean, there's there's way too many people who rely on this and you need to, you need to have a plan for that if, if that's what you're going to do, and it's going to take a year or two. Um, but but we have no way of doing that in an automated fashion. I mean, I've, I've used criticality score. I've played around with some things, but I'd love to have that native in the in particular in the GraphQL API. I also know it's computationally expensive. 
which is why you don't have it. Because I've, I've talked to people at GitHub about this before in the past. Well, no promise. That's a great example. No, no promises, obviously, but that's a, a closely related to an area that we're working on. So uh, I'd love to talk more about that and see if we can help out there. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, Christine, you have your hand up. Yeah, I can probably go through because I was actually trying to figure this out with our GitHub and going through all of the metrics and auditing and what we would like to see. And I'm still learning it, so I might it might be there, but I might not know. But some, for, for example, we want to know when somebody was last active in the overall GitHub org so that we can see whether we need to boot them out of the org, so some, some semblance of activity, whatever that means. And, and then I, I, I'm probably going to send you some feedback probably through Slack. So I'm going through everything and figuring out, does the GitHub API have it? Do I need to find it from the Insights dashboard? Uh, so so I'll, I'll give you more. Uh, more feedback, but that was one that came off the top of my head. Anything else we want to bring up in the meeting around the API? Just a quick question, Eric. The reference implementations, were you looking at like potential metric models that might be useful to look at or actually deployed systems? Deployed systems, yeah. So ideally, it would be like, you know, here's a, uh, I don't know, cauldron, or here's here's an open source tool that you could use. Here's here's a way to get started with it, and here's the uh, kind of uh, first first five things that you should look at that would that would help you um, understand the the health of your projects. Gotcha. I'll ping you on Slack. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, one more thing uh, for the agenda: should we should we skip the meeting on July fourteenth for Fossey? Because it does look like in chat a lot of a lot of us are going to be at Fossey. Um, so yes, meet up at Fossey. Sounds good. Um, I think Anybody? so. We canceled the the scientific software working group, which is same just an hour before this, and it would make sense here as well. I think. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's plan to do that, and we'll just plan to cancel the the one on the fourteenth. Elizabeth, is that something you can fix on the calendar? Okay. Awesome. So we'll we'll do uh, we'll do that. Um, anything, anything else quick that we want to talk about in our remaining, I don't know how many times I've asked this, it just not, does not stick in my head. Do we end at a quarter till or 10 till? 10 till, but or <laughs> when we're done. Oh well, yeah. I was, I was driving for a done. quarter till and then it just occurred to me that it was probably 10 till and I, Matt and Sophia are laughing at me because I, I don't know how many times I asked this in meetings. Um, Okay, sorry, anything else people want to talk about quickly? Um, so, so like, um, I might have um, started to um, use um, um, some of the like um, metrics to um, um, identify um, um, groups of um, repositories. Um, so, so that way, um, we can like, um, make, um, best practices, um, policies, um, et cetera, um, for, um, um, cohorts, um, to make, um, 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 hospital's job, um, easier um, because like uh, we have like a uh, 13 um, thousand um, repositories um, with like a uh, different um, like, needs. Um, so I was like um, wondering if anyone else um, in like a uh, their, their um, um, experiences uh, like um, taking um, 
these like um metrics and like um turning them into um cohorts of um of um repositories that are um used by um 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 ospo as opposed to like um um repository um health thing um shown to the um repositories um themselves it's a really good question i mean it's it's something that um that we've done with the metrics, at least within the CNCF. So I, I don't exactly know how we've done this with within Augur or Grimoire Lab, but but it is something that we look at within CNCF dev stats because there are projects like, like for example, Kubernetes. That's that's not just multiple repos that you have to look at, it's multiple GitHub orgs that that basically form the basis of, of one project. And I know at, at VMware, one of the things we've looked at is we have a couple of of projects that are within some of the VMware orgs that have, you know, four or five repos, but it's all kind of the same, the same project. And, you know, we want to look at it as the same project and not necessarily as, as separate, separate repositories. I'm curious, Sean, what, what you think about that from an Augur perspective, whether you've looked at like groups of repositories or code. So we, we handle it two ways. The first is if you just put a GitHub org in, we'll get all the repos for you. The second is now with Augur, you can log in and create a list of gr a group that is composed of whatever you want it to be composed of. So if you just want to look at one group, one GitHub org as the group, or if you have a project or area management or interest that spans multiple orgs and select repositories you can create your own group for that as well yeah so, like so so like um topia layer i'm like i uh, talking about like a uh, um for programmatically making a uh, groups of uh repositories right so like um all the like um repositories that like i build a package or right. um all the um repositories that have like more than um um 15 uh commits in the past like uh 60 days and then if you like i uh, combine um those two you get like um actively developing um, um, repositories that like build a package. And so like I, you can like build up on um, understanding of like groups of like repositories um, at scale that would like um, otherwise require you to like read every um, read me um, but you're not going to do past like 200 readmeets or something. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. So you're talking about um, automating the grouping based on a certain set of rules that you might put together. Right. Yeah. So, so like taking like some of the like um, metrics work and uh, applying uh, their thresholds that then like say like like um, um, between um, um, cut off um, A and B, um, it, it's a cohort uh, um, um, type. And then um, every like a uh, repository would have a, a true or false like um, value or like um, every uh, type of a uh, cohort. We've, um, from an analytical perspective, that's similar to this idea that um, I'm looking right now with Augur data across like 100,000 repositories from different domains, trying to, to describe how different organizations, corporate government, scientific, academic, how, how their patterns of engagement are different. And, and so, the ability to say, okay, I, 
I've got maybe um, my ASP has 11,000 repos. I'm most interested in the ones that have activity and then creating a group of those, I think is what I hear you saying. Yeah. Like that would so, be one so, choice you could make. Yeah. So, so like, um, we've got like, um, come community, um, cohorts mm -hmm. of like, uh, toy, uh, um, oh, love, um, stadium and, uh, the federation, mm -hmm. um, not yet egg balls groupings. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which I know from Remy, <laughs> I remembered them the other day. I'd read them before, but I'd forgotten. So Sophia, I I'm curious what your perspective is because Google operates at a similar scale. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about it because I actually also struggle with this problem uh, in that when we're looking at everything, it's hard to apply groupings because a lot of them are subjective. So I think for very, for select projects or we have more robust metrics or tracking around them, we've had project leaders say what they explicitly want to be included in those metrics programs, which it could include things outside of just that central organization um, from an organization management perspective as OSPO encouraging practices and better groupings. Um, we do have explicit policies around organization creation. Uh, one year project can have its own organization. If it's something large enough, then it can warrant that. And then everything can be grouped under that organization. And then from at least a GitHub perspective, it's, it's nice and logically grouped as that one thing. Um, but that still tends to leave things on the fringe that should be included, say, I always like to use the project Golang and I, I presented this publicly a number of times, so I'm not spilling any beans, but we have our Golang organization, which has 55 repositories under Golang organization, but then there are other projects delve and play with Go that sit under either personal repositories or other affiliate repositories that are actually part of the, an integral to the Golang community. And so we've manually added them in uh, for our metrics program and to look at it. So I think for things that we are actively looking at, then it does require some like sort of manual selection. Um, the other way that things can happen is there is some logical grouping with functionality, say things like the cloud native um, space where there's also like the affiliation with the CNCF and that CNCF umbrella. Um, and that does have some related correlation to our organizational structure as Google. Um, so a lot of, say, those projects or people who work on those projects all roll up to the same VP. So they tend to be looked at together or grouped together logically. Um, so there is an element of organizational structure that's also at play in terms of how we group and think about project spaces. Um, and then there's a, on the other side on the compliance team where there's a lot of logical grouping that are happening for things like activity levels. Are we working on this? Are we not working on this? Do we need to put this as a candidate for archival? Um, and so then there are things applied to our own repositories that are more around compliance checks, how much we are, like, is this an archive project, a current project? Project, do we need to go tap? Like, what are the actions we're going to take because it's in sort of this middle ground? Um, and so then there are also logical groupings that are happening on sort of a management and hygiene perspective. Um, but I think on, a, on an aggregate scale, this is not something that has been addressed well. I think some of the things that we're thinking about are how do we create a better metadata structure around it? Because something like this kind of information can't really go on GitHub necessarily because uh, it's something that might change and also. Like, I don't think that other people that are pulling from these repositories on GitHub necessarily care. <laughs> and it's because it is subject to how we think about these repositories and groupings of them as a company. Um, and so I think a project that I'm really hoping can help us eventually would be something like Guac, which is happening inside the OpenSSF community, um, which is looking at creating a metadata structure around repositories and labeling and other types of data. Um, not to say that this is anywhere near ready yet, uh, but it's something that I've been following as a way to potentially start to provide more logic around how we can understand where these things fit inside our organization. Well, thanks. I think we are we are now a little bit over time, but I think that was worth the discussion because that was a really interesting discussion. And I think something a lot of us uh, struggle with. I would encourage you, Justin, to maybe ask that question again in Slack and see if maybe some people who aren't in this meeting have, have some other perspectives. 
Um, yeah. We can also add it to the agenda again if we want to spend a little yeah. bit more time about it um, at an upcoming meeting. So, so think about that as well. But, but thanks, thanks for that. That was a really, really interesting topic. Okay, so we're going to skip the next meeting. So we'll uh, we'll see you all in a month. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.